Welcome to the IBM Podcast Network. This podcast is an IBM production and you can also check out their other awesome shows like My Neighbor Zuckerberg, a show that talks to entrepreneurs from all over the country and brings you their stories, adventures and what makes them who they are today. You're listening to the Drinks and Destinations podcast. Just a couple of days back, I was sent an open bottle of a very expensive Italian Super Tuscan wine to taste and tell if the wine was fine. Uh, the party who had purchased the wine had a complaint about the finish of the wine, which gave her the kind of doubt that it might have been corked. Sometimes it's hard to tell if there's a problem with a particular wine unless you know the style and the grape varieties and the region that the wine comes from. It's kind of hard to basically understand whether the wine has actually gone bad. However, there are some unique telltales that can help you judge if your wine is fine to drink or it has a fault. In today's episode, Samira and I are going to share some tips with you in our Wine 101 segment. So, welcome to another new episode of the Drinks and Destinations podcast, your favorite podcast that brings to you news, views and stories from the world of wine, spirits and travel. Absolutely and uh, also we have coming up in the episode today is information on caps, closures, especially natural corks which are used as stoppers for wine and spirits too. And in the D&D chat segment today we have an interview with Carlos de Jesus, marketing director of Amrim which is world's largest natural cork producing company which is based in Portugal. What's the best new restaurant in town? Which bar sucked? What's the worst new Hindi film? What's the most obscure thing to do on the weekend? And what's the most interesting new walking tour? If you want to know how to make the most of Bombay, listen to the podcast by the dailypow.com. We are Pranuti, Amit and Purva. We're your guide to what to do, see and eat in the city. New episodes are out every Monday on the dailypow.com and on iTunes, Audio Boom, SoundCloud, the IVM podcast app or on any other podcasting app you prefer. Wine 101. All right, so let's begin with the Wine 101 section and the big topic today that we are discussing is the different ways a wine is sealed or closed and uh, there's one way to seal it is with a cork and the other way is with a cap. And uh, again, there are many other ways actually. Even glass caps closures have oh. come up in the last few years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, so we're going to be talking about that. But uh, and also like, how do you identify a fault in a wine, and how can you tell if a wine is corked? Yes, I think that's a very. Uh, big debate right. uh, because uh, people there are a lot of people who believe that natural cork is the best way you can have your wine preserved in a bottle and there are some people who believe that you know cork actually doesn't help too much and screw caps could do the same thing as exactly. well exactly and even the but, perception rajita if you talk about it like the wine with a cork closure is you know the perception, much more premium yeah, much and more expensive premium, more like a yeah. wine yeah that's but that's changing in. from what we have read yeah. and experienced and especially regions like Australia who yeah. have transformed completely their closers uh, industry mm-hmm. to screw caps instead of uh, natural corks and uh, so that's that's what has happened in the right. last few years but there are you know, there are times when people have no idea how exactly to find a fault in a wine. Mm-hmm. And it's not always the fault of the cork, by the way. I mean, oh. it's not the, you know, the cork is not the only reason. There are a lot of other reasons. But let's start with the cork part first. Right. So, in technical wine terminology, a wine with TCA problem mm-hmm. means that it has the cork problem. Right. Trichloroanisol is the natural compound that at higher levels can impact musty flavors and aromas to wines and other beverages and foods. So, wines that contain TCA at a detectable level are described as the ones which are basically the corked ones mm-hmm. or the corkiness of the wine. That's where the, it comes from. Right. And uh, corked wine is a term for a wine that has become contaminated with cork tent. Mm-hmm. And uh, cork tent is not simply the taste of a cork. Uh, rather, it's caused by the presence of this chemical compound called TCA. And uh, TCA is usually formed when natural fungi, which is which may uh, reside in the cork, comes in contact with certain chlorides found in bleaches and other winery sanitation or sterilization products, mm-hmm. which are used in any of the wineries, you know. And sometimes that comes in contact with the cork, and that's how the the process basically starts. So if a winery uses infected corks, the wine becomes tainted. Mm-hmm. If 
let loose tca can actually contaminate not just a single batch of corks and wine but it can also infect an entire cellar or a winery oh my so god so you can imagine the tca could be a big problem for yeah. a winery if it goes um, you know undetected which means that entire batch of wine could completely go yeah, because from what i had understood like indefinitely about even from a production about 2 to 3% would be cork tainted wines But uh, here you're yes. saying it's possible that an entire batch. batch. That's yeah, pretty. because TCA, if it's you know not controlled properly, then it could contaminate the entire winery. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's why most of the wineries, uh, since the discovery, only as recent as early 1990s, mm-hmm. because the use of natural cork has been around since 1400. Mm-hmm. So it's been there for a very long time. Right. So just since 1990s, most of the cork uh, uh, taint, uh, which is caused by this uh, particular chemical mm. wineries have totally eliminated uh, the use of chlorine based clearing products which All could right. affect i mean somehow influence the tca exactly problem. and for everyone out there i guess who's wondering like how does a corked wine really taste it has like this taste of damp soggy wet or rotten card- cardboard kind of yeah, taste right and exactly. like the smell also like from the nose you can clearly is there a distinct way someone can tell because a lot of times like a wine also has this uh, Woody Tabasco kind See, of See woody is know? a kind of uh, wine so woody right. uh, woodiness comes from the barrel that is being exactly, aged in yeah. so that's a good thing to have in a yeah. wine mm-hmm. but uh, too much of woodiness and mm-hmm. that rotten wood Mm-hmm. that that kind of smell which you get that's not the good so there is definitely a distinct way you can it tell is, that absolutely. the wine is yeah cork. you can okay. easily make out that you know the wine is uh, cork that there is a cork tint in the wine or maybe it's you know the tca problem mm-hmm. especially the damp uh, yeah. smell that you know the moment you open a bottle of wine and you pour it in the glass and you get that damp mm-hmm. smell or sometimes there are experts who actually can tell you the moment you open the bottle of wine mm-hmm. uh, from the look of the cork they can tell you that it's already been gone oh, bad wow. yeah so and like the yeah. recent experience i was talking about yeah, the wine yeah. which was sent to mm-hmm. me the cork was completely dry so which okay. means that the wine did not Uh, uh come in contact with the cork for a very long time which means the you know there there was a some there was some problem with the wine mm-hmm. but it wasn't really detectable it wasn't completely oxidized but this was on the verge of actually going bad okay so and is there also like a preference like they say that the red wines are better off with a natural cork whereas the white wines can have a sealed cap and See the thing is because a lot of people believe that most of the uh, red wines in the world can be aged for longer than right. white but mm-hmm. there are also white wines which age for a very long time when mm-hmm. you talk about the chablis wines or i mean the wines from burgundy and a lot of other places right. and uh, the chardonnays which are aged on uh, barrel and they are also uh, they have a cork closer mm-hmm. uh, but uh, the thing is there is no such thing as red wine being uh, better preserved in a cork and white wine better being in a screw cap okay. because there are a lot of uh, debates which are going on right now True. and uh, cork tent is a huge problem in regions like california where mm-hmm. you know sometimes uh, out of 900 samples some people have tasted at least 8 to 10% of uh, cork tent in those wines mm-hmm. so it's still not final yet but yeah. yeah i think the industry is still learning a lot of things about uh, the problems with cork so there was an enologist in sicily who just recently mm. said that due to the rising cost of uh, many uh, you know cost of uh, this natural cork many mm-hmm. producers are now moving away from the portuguese option because mm. portugal is the number one cork producing uh, country in the world uh, which you all know and they also make the best corks and uh, looking at dif- now people are looking at different options for that and right. quality wine needs quality wrapping and of course it comes with a quality price so that's what the debate is so basically cork is not the only one to blame uh, and mm-hmm. uh, say that you know the wine is at fault there are a lot of other things like when you say a wine is oxidized mm. what exactly it means it means that the contamination caused by too much of oxygen exposure to the wine right and you know when uh, you leave a sliced apple out on the counter it turns brown that's mm-hmm. what exactly it means uh, when you talk about oxidation of the o- oxidization of the wine mm-hmm. and that's a very common fault how can you tell that because uh, the oxidized wines would always lose their brightness both in color and in flavor and uh, if it's a suppose it's a chardonnay mm-hmm. and when you look at it it would be like a d- instead of a maybe a pale gold mm-hmm. uh, or a pale straw color it mm-hmm. would be like a deep gold or deep amber 
so which okay. is not supposed to be right so then you know that you know the wine is actually oxidized okay. completely it has brownish orange color mm-hmm. uh, fresh taste uh, developed drier mm-hmm. and more bitter characteristics actually uh, come in the wine mm-hmm. and how do you fix it uh, you can prolong the shelf life of open wine by using a wine preserving tool mm-hmm. and if your bottle is oxidized right off the shelf it's then obviously it's you can't uh, you know do anything about that mm-hmm. but once you open your wine if you keep it uh, properly in the freezer or your you know the proper mm. cooling place mm. then the wine can stay for a longer period of time so oxi- okay. oxidization basically happens when the you know too much of uh, oxygen contact comes, comes contact to the wine, the wine. Yeah. Right. then tca is the problem which we have discussed already mm-hmm. and then th- also there is a problem of heat damage so ex- okay. excessive heat right. is also really bad for your wine and that's one of the reasons why we insist on uh, keeping the wines you know uh, cooler in a place like india where uh, yeah, the so room temperature is a totally exactly. no no concept exactly so you know i have to talk about this like i've been to places and even i used to be of that notion earlier like if especially when you order like a glass of red and they uh, bring it out from a chill and they serve you like a cold glass of red wine you are like no this is supposed to be room temperature where you learn over a period of time that being in india which is a tropical country like you you might not want yeah. or enjoy a room temperature wine so that term yeah. would necessarily be for like the colder countries yes, right yes exactly so that's applicable for places where the room temperature is around 20 degrees or right. maybe lesser than that you know so then over there they're not fine. chilled at all right yeah they are just okay. kept in you know other underground cellars or maybe in one corner of the room and then the wine still stay right. absolutely fine you yeah. can't do the same in india yeah. it's totally impossible so we just impossible. need to like put it out there because i've seen like people like giving like poor waiters a hard time saying oh my god it's supposed to be room temperature yeah. well probably not no Want and especially with the boiling glass of yeah. wine you can't have those red wines with that room temperature right. uh, but uh, yes how can you tell that because uh, the light strike occurs more commonly in delicate white wines like champagne pinot grigio and sauvignon blanc and mm-hmm. they are the ones very sensitive and the moment uh, there is excessive heat uh, that comes in contact with the wine then they totally damage but you have to be really smart about storing your wine and uh, keep it out of direct sunlight and okay. that's when the wine will be fine then there are microbial and bacterial taint which also uh, is a cause of fault in your wine sometimes okay. so many microbes can live in wine in addition to yeast so if one of these uh, colonies becomes too aggressively present Uh, pre or post alcoholic fermentation mm. then you can start to get various off aromas aromas okay. which are not a uh, characteristic of the particular grape variety okay. so that could be one of the reasons and there's another one which mm. is a sulfur compound okay so as you know that uh, you know while the uh, wine production is taking place mm. there are also natural sulfur that's produced and there are also artificial sulfurs mm. little bit uh, added to the wine to keep it uh, for a longer period of time which, okay. uh, which is a uh, within an Uh, i mean limit that is allowed by mm-hmm. the particular region or the government so sometimes the sulfur could be a reason why your wine would be tasting really so bad so that's like an excess of sulfur yeah so your, some wineries yeah. who don't uh, believe in the quality control and right. you know that could be uh, it's kind of uh, complicated because uh, it stabilizes the wine mm-hmm. but uh, so2 manifests as sort of smoky struck match aroma mm-hmm. but really isn't bad for you at all mm-hmm. but uh, it, you know high amount of sulfur could cause headache to some people okay uh, but there, there is a way to avoid that um, you can basically decant the wine for some time and the sulfur smell that that just goes away Mm. and uh, that's how you just uh, walk around on that wine but not all wine faults are actually wine faults like you know the volatile acidity in a wine or the tartar crystals in a wine or the herbal aromas for that mm-hmm. matter they are actually good aromas in a wine so they're not always bad so it's not always just the cork which needs to be blamed there are a lot of other elements as well so let's go on a short break now and when we come back we talk more about closures Hi, I'm Amit Verma, the host of the weekly podcast The Scene and the Unseen. In my show, I examine the scene effects and the unintended consequences of public policy and private action. I show how policies meant to help the poor often end up hurting the poor. I've done episodes so far on demonetization, GST, surgical strikes, immigration and MRP, and I will continue my forensic assault on the truth in the weeks to come. Catch the show every Monday on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app, and go to seenunseen.in for all the latest updates. 
Welcome back and uh, today we are talking about different kind of closures for wine and uh, we discussed corked wine before going on the break and we figured out like lot of elements even apart from the ceiling that can be responsible for your wine going bad but uh, coming back to closures a lot of problem with the corks we have noticed and a lot of debate going on over there uh, for the last decade or so and there have been plenty of like uh, cork substitutes that have been introduced in the market and yes. one of them was synthetic cork yeah. which was uh, I don't like them at all exactly so which honestly. was kind of like oh is this the uh, you know solution the to the problem apparently wasn't so much because you know new technologies definitely uh, gave us greatly improved synthetic corks but uh, some of the problems still remain especially with the plastic ones because it turned out like they're hard to pull and if you like to recork a bottle and put it back in the fridge they're even harder to get back into the neck so you know yeah. uh, rajita like you're saying so we have this problem with natural cork and then you're saying you don't like synthetic corks any <laughs> specific reason for that you know i can uh, give you an example mm-hmm. uh, i know this wine company in india Okay. Uh, who used to make really good wines for a very long time okay. and suddenly in a year they decided to change from natural cork to uh, synthetic cork mm-hmm. and the taste of those wines changed mm. in those vintages and oh. i met the wine producers recently i don't want to take names of the winery right. because obviously it's going to uh, be a, you know be a problem for them but even they agreed that synthetic corks sometimes uh, don't work i mean they, they might be a good uh, cost effective solution mm-hmm. uh, but natural corks are still better than uh, synthetic corks and plus it does affect the wine it just the wine feels so trapped and you know th- the thing with natural corks is that you know there is a natural o- oxygen gen contact that uh, passes through the natural which cork which is required which is like required for amount. the wine yeah mm-hmm. that amount of natural uh, air is required in the wine mm-hmm. but synthetic corks i think they restrict too much of uh, uh, you know oxygen into the going into the wine and then it just stops the evolution process that's what i feel i mean mm-hmm. so that's my personal opinion right. but however when we are talking about this debate right. let's just see yeah. uh, the pros and cons of having a natural cork and uh, screw Sin- caps yes yeah so let's start um, natural cork has the advantage of being obviously a natural renewable resource right and it, it's been historically preferred by all you know traditional wine making countries all over the world right and then long term aging it mm. has been proven that for long term aging you definitely require a good quality of natural cork okay the consequences of that would be expensive of course is at right. least 2 to 3 times more expensive than your screw mm-hmm. caps or any other closure 1 to 3% uh, are usually affected by the cork tent which mm-hmm. we discussed earlier and it's also because it's na- limited natural resources obviously because how many cork trees can you have yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> there is a limit to that right and yeah. then uh, variable quality because mm-hmm. not always you get the best quality of uh, corks because mm-hmm. portugal could be the best uh, pr- cork producing country in the world but there could be another region which is not doing such right. good qualities and natural corks breathe at uh, variable rates that's mm-hmm. another thing which is a problem with natural corks because okay. you cannot control the uh, exact air contact with the wine because mm-hmm. it's it varies from you know cork to cork because yeah. obviously it's natural so you know there is a problem with that so the alternative option is of course uh, your screw cap right and uh, what is the pros for screw cap is firstly like, i would just like to say they're so easy to open <laughs> you know there's yeah, of no course they are. you're not running around for a wine yeah, opener yeah you don't need to have like, a yeah, wine opener that all moment really last you. minute at a party where you're like this is a great bottle of wine but hey i don't have a wine yeah, opener true and also i believe it's preferred because it does not allow oxygen to enter the bottle so like how earlier we were talking about the problem of uh, oxidization mm. of wine mm. so that does not happen in a sealed wine yes a, besides the fact that obviously if it's left open uh, for heat damage and a right. lot of other yeah. stuff but, like but yes i said yeah. it's limited i mean mm-hmm. though much more restricted than a natural cork right. would be Um, but the other thing is it's more affordable as okay. an option mm-hmm. and uh, so obviously and there is no tc or cork tent right. in it uh, long term aging studies have shown positive results so okay. there have been experimentations happening with screw caps as well like mm-hmm. as i told you that a lot of uh, australian wine industries uh, companies right. they have shifted from uh, cork to screw caps completely okay and then the as you mentioned it's very easy to open yeah. but what are the consequences uh, some cork alternatives don't breathe 
like mm-hmm. and they're too tight right. like uh, i remember visiting one of the wineries in sicily couple of years back right. and they looked like that was a very modern winery mm-hmm. and they were just shifting to glass closures Oh. And it is a little expensive in terms of uh, production, yeah. and uh, not very popular, I would imagine. Yeah, it's in not many of, people do yeah. that, but yeah. they they were trying to experiment, and they say that you know it works pretty well for their wines. Uh, I don't know how far they are doing it, uh, whether yeah. they are doing it even now or not. I would imagine not. it to be like a very expensive proposition. It right? is like expensive. It would turn out to that be, yeah. that basically increases the price yeah. of your wine mm-hmm. um, totally. But uh, the usually the screw caps are recyclable, but not biodegradable. Mm-hmm. So that's another problem with them. Then the variable uh, manufacturing quality, which is there, which you can't control. Then associated with cheap wine, sometimes yeah, screw caps. Which are, we were talking about the whole perception. Yeah. That if you gift someone, like I would be a little hesitant to give someone like a. Screw cap wine bottle. Still, you know, like yeah. if I'm really gifting to make an impression, and uh, I think maybe in know, India, and that's the reason of doing an episode like this so that yeah. people understand that it's not always, always yeah. bad to have a wine on screw cap. But uh, because we are talking about uh, natural corks today, mm-hmm. we uh, in the D and D chat segment yeah. today we are going to talk about a very interesting uh, company which produces natural cork. They've been around for a very long time. Oh wow! They've been doing business. in india for a very long time in fact so you spoke to them yes so and did you what are they going to switch to seal caps at any time can i uh, <laughs> not to no, the interview no, no. no. no of sticking. course their business is natural cork so okay. they will be making natural they cork they stand by that and uh, yeah so the company's name is amrim and okay. i met the marketing director mr uh, carlos t jesus mm-hmm. and uh, yeah so in the dnd chat segment we talked to him Did you know India's most popular music festival was in a way conceived in Estonia? We speak to someone who knows a thing or two about making the NS7 weekender happen. Did you know that some termites in Africa have a pleasant minty flavor and just as well because we might all be eating them in a few years anyway? Did you know that the world's greatest collection of human knowledge got its initial funding from a porn site? That's how Wikipedia started and we tell you how it works. Hey, I'm Chuck. I'm Naren and I'm Srikith and together we are Simplified. Your fortnightly look at burning issues that you should know about. Told to you in a way you'll understand with humor, bad jokes and PG Wodehouse references so that you can look smarter with minimal effort. Be smart, funny, erudite and wise and ultra crepidarian. Wait, what's that? To find out, tune into our show. Episodes out every fortnight on all podcast apps near you, and on the IVM podcast app as well. Oh yeah! D and D chat. All right, so let's jump into our conversation with Carlos De Jesus. So can you tell me what's happening with the uh, the cork scenario all over the world now? There was a time when people started to shift from uh, you know natural cork to uh, your synthetic corks or you know screw caps and uh, the closer industry in general has gone to gone through a lot of evolution in the past few years. So think, where does it stand? I think we are today in a place that it's radically different than what a lot of people thought would be the case uh, 10 years 12 years ago. to give you an idea where we are today and try to translate that into figures into numbers um we have a total of about 18 billion bottles that are filled and stopped every year with something mm-hmm. and if that sounds like a lot to your listeners it's not <laughs> because that's about a fraction not a fraction but about half of what goes uh, into production because a big chunk of it never sees a bottle mm-hmm. it goes to a bag in box it goes to uh bulk, it goes to brandy, distillery, whatever it is, we don't consider that part of our natural market. But our natural market of 18 billion, mm-hmm. roughly 12 billion are made out of cork. Amarin, by the way, last wow. year made 4.4 billion of those, uh, of those corks. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, as a Monty Python would say, we're not quite dead yet, <laughs> far from it. But we had, no doubt about it, uh, some challenging times. And those challenging times led to, again, the situation where we are today and of the 12 billion uh, screw caps will have roughly 4.7 4.8 billion units mm-hmm. and plastics clearly the big loser of this three way race if you will uh, and today will be about 1.8 uh, 2 billion let's mm-hmm. give let's round it that up so we're looking at the scenario where cork not only held its ground mm-hmm. um, but it actually managed to recapture some very important slices of the market mm-hmm. uh, exports from portugal alone 
uh, and you have core companies in other countries, uh, Spain, Germany, uh, Austria, uh, France, you name it. But from Portugal alone, cork exports have been growing every year, compounded annual growth rate, a little bit over 2%. Mm -hmm. Consumption of wine worldwide, depending on whom you ask, goes anywhere from 0.8 to 1.2%. Mm -hmm. So in fact, we are, as we say, gaining a little bit of market share. So the question today, I think, is why? Why is always a good question. You know, you can ask, you should ask kids and politicians why, always. <laughs> and you should ask the closure business also why. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to look at several factors to explain that. Mm -hmm. One of them, clearly, the advances that needed to be implemented in the cork industry. Mm -hmm. I think often you can be a victim of your own success. Yes. And when you have, you know, 97, 98% market share, uh, it doesn't matter if you are a telecom in the 90s, uh, in Europe, or, you know, any other business that has that kind of massive uh, market share. Uh, your propensity to listen does not go up, let me put it that way. So we, we pay the price. Um, and from the, that 97, 98% market share today, we're at about 70, as I was mentioning. So it's a price, uh, but it was also the proverbial kick in the pants, if, mm -hmm. you, if you will. Yeah. Can we say that in your podcast? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. It's not like American <laughs> television where you have to censor everything, right? Uh, no, but seriously, we, we did get that, that big push. Mm -hmm. And I think in the end, that led to investment. Investment led to better quality, better quality led to better results, mm. which in turn allow us to reinforce that investment uh, to the point where we are, as I was saying, uh, in a position that bodes well for the future. Mm -hmm. So, uh, can you, for the listeners to understand, can you tell me why is natural cork important for wine as a closer? Uh, I think there are many, many reasons for that. Uh, technical reasons. Um, certainly matter because uh, you have the basic function of any closure which is to keep the liquid inside the vessel yeah. right? Um, and that's what we need to first and above all be able to perform but we also have to perform well at sensory level we also have to perform well at the level of oxygen ingress yeah. that reaches that wine inside, inside that vessel in this case a, a, a glass bottle mm -hmm. um, and cork delivers ticks all the right boxes from a technical point of view, but it does something else. From a, an environmental and a sustainable point of view, I mean, that it's an incredible strong credentials that Cork can put together. Mm -hmm. After all, we never cut down the trees to extract this wonderful material, right? Yeah. And then there's a third issue that I think is very, very important. It's about the premium aspect that packaging can bring to wine or any other industry. Listen. Wine, wineries and winemakers and, uh, are not there, and wine retailers, they're not there to sell closures. They're there to sell wine. But they're there to sell wine at the highest possible price point, not at the lowest possible price point. And when you look at cork, you look at a very, very premium packaging. So you bring all this together, technical aspects, sustainability aspects, premium or value-added creation capabilities, you bring it all together into a product that packs 800 million cells on average into one single natural whole cork stopper. And you tell me, Fajit, is this a product of the past? No, it's a product of the future, because the future has to deliver on all of those key items, technical aspects, sustainability aspects, and consumer preference aspects. So when you deliver so strongly on all of them, really, should we be surprised that we close seven out of every ten bottles of wine in this world? Perhaps we should. Um, but again, this is not to... Uh, ignore the problems that needed to be resolved and fortunately they were resolved. Mm -hmm. Cork comes from an oak, mm -hmm. it's a cork oak, so it's a cork it's, uh, family of trees, so when you say strong as an oak, that's what we're talking about. These are trees that can live 250 years mm -hmm. easily um, and they can, be extra they can be harvested 12, 15 times throughout their lifespan, but okay. they are never ever cut down. In fact, it is prohibited by law from cutting down even a dead tree. Oh. So this is how um, conservancy laws can be put into effect. And in Portugal, cork oaks are in some shape or form protected by law since the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. So uh, we take very good care. We don't have oil. We don't have a lot of great resources, natural resources like India has. <laughs> uh, but we have one thing um, that we take very good care of, and that's our cork oaks. Hence the fact that Portugal being the smallest geographically of the seven cork producing countries in the Western Mediterranean Basin, 
France, Spain, Algeria, uh, Tunisia, Morocco, Italy, despite being the smallest, we do have the largest area by far. So of 2.2 million hectares that exist around the world, in Portugal we have about 730,000. So uh, if someone in India has some doubts about the effect of conservancy laws when well enforced, this is a good answer to that. And uh, so we're talking about India and uh, the Indian market in general. You also supply cocks to, not cocks, but uh, caps, the different kinds of closures to spirits companies? That's correct. We In India we supply both closures for wine, closures for sparkling, and closures for the spirits industry. Okay. So we ran the whole portfolio. Um, and I think it's a market that, like everybody else, we're terribly excited about it because we see what we think. We, we're in in Germany, in Dusseldorf, at Pro Wine, the largest wine fair in the world, and you're seeing wineries from India. from India present here. I go to yeah. London, I see them. I, I go to other fairs, and I see them. So it's mm. it's very exciting because it's not just because it's a, a big market, mm. and of course, big markets are important in the context where consumption in Europe is going down as mm. it is going down. Yeah. So of course, naturally, everybody looks around and say, how can we export? It's not just that, it's maybe, I don't know, maybe because there's always been this close proximity between India and Portugal. Yes, we have a lot of uh, history and historical connection. We have a lot of history and historical yeah. connection and, and, and our Prime Minister visited India not long ago, uh, a few months ago in, in fact, and that became very, very clear. It's, for us, it's not just any other market. Mm. It's a different market. I was in Cuisine in, in August. Mm. I mean, there's no way you are yeah. Portuguese and you arrive in Kushim and you don't feel something. And we have a big uh, colony of uh, you know, Portuguese in uh, Goa. In and, Goa? Yeah. yeah so I'm not even going that far. I mean, yeah. that's like the obvious, right? Yeah. But even before you get to that mm. point, there is so much, so much mm. going, going on. So it's not just any other market. We want this market to be successful. Uh, we like this. I, I think, you know, our colleagues that go to India often, they have you know, a lot of luck because they could be going to a lot of other markets that are nowhere near as interesting as, yeah. as India. So we want you guys to succeed very, very much. So, and I think, and I think you will. I think there are certain. Uh, we need to understand uh, the role. And speaking about packaging in particular, I think uh, when you go to some of the big brands in, in in India, we need to do a better job at explaining what we've been discussing here. We've been uh, doing a good job in explaining why package matters mm. uh, but we're not making such a good job in explaining the price differential that package can bring to the wine producers mm -hmm. and I give you an example when you go to a country like China for example it can be as much as 50 cents on the euro mm. difference when you go to the United States the, the difference of price between a bottle closed with closure um, sorry uh, a bottle closed with cork and the bottle closed with any other artificial closure, the difference can be $1.74 uh, $1 per bottle. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about bottles of $300 or 300 euros here. We're mm -hmm. talking about bottles that cost 10, 12, 14. Yeah. So that's a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to make that case in a stronger manner with the local winery. So, But that's just another excuse to go to India. So. Mm -hmm. And how many years have you been in India in Tokyo? Oh gosh, we've been doing business in India. I joined the company 11 years ago, and we were already doing business in India. Yeah, it's uh, been really long. I said, oh, decades. We've been, we've been, yeah. we haven't had the strong presence that we have now. That's yeah. for sure. Uh, but again, the industry probably was not as as developed, you know, 15 or 20 or 30 years ago as it yeah, is today. Yeah, now it's growing. But, but we're doing it. Yeah. And India is not just a market for cork closures. India is a market for other cork products also. Mm. And when you look at the auto industry, for example, we do a lot of gaskets, we do a lot of auto industry components mm. and, and, and the aerospace materials. We do a lot of other things with cork, mm. not just not closures, just obviously. Yeah. Uh, and that market was always present for us there. Mm. Uh, I think you know it's going to go higher, not lower, that's mm. for sure. Great. Thank you so much, Father. All right. Well, that was really an interesting conversation, Rajita. And uh, well, I'm looking forward to that, that, you know, cocktails could be reduced to a great extent yeah. and uh, TCA proof. 
you yeah. think uh, that's a great possibility maybe that's the future you never know yeah. that's what amrim is working on yeah. at the moment and uh, hopefully we will actually have a 100% tca proof natural cork and he's definitely not advocating like a cap seal yeah. anytime no. he's he, he's yeah. saying that corks are the future and that's the way wine should be sealed and yeah. served so yes very interesting conversation and i hope our listeners enjoyed and now they can tell the difference when a wine really actually goes bad and uh, you know if they want to pick up like a uh, wine that is sealed by a cork or a cap go for it as long as your wine tastes good yeah absolutely <laughs> so that's all for today guys you can tune into the drinks and destinations podcast on iTunes SoundCloud Audio Boom or any other podcast app you can also download the IVM podcast app on iOS or Android you can also give your reviews and suggestions on drinks and destinations at gmail.com Also tune in to our next episode every fortnight and remember while we all love our tipple make sure that, that you, you drink, drink responsibly. responsibly bye Excuse me bhaiya excuse me bole madam menu mein kya hai menu mein seen and seen hai podcast hai on course hai cyrus hai marine in india rediscovery project empowering series sex wax hai ivm likes hai simplified hai keeping it queer hai things and destinations hai my neighbor zuckerberg hai aur the fan garage aapko kya chahiye hai uh ek baar repeat kar denge kya repeat repeat nahi karta hum aap jao ivmpodcast.com pe aur suno ye sab ya fir download karo unka app sab aapki ungliyon pe